unser Kultura, Präsident des DV. Mr. Kultura is B, president of the DVW. DVW. Um, now the slogan of the Institute is, is uh, knowledge and action for planet Earth. You use um, this um, slogan is for our Earth. Why? Earth. Well, it is our Earth. If we talk about the Earth, that's an abstract um, magnitude that we can't seize. Uh, but if we look at current developments, especially in this year, then we know um, this topic is very um, connected to emotions because they concern us directly. We as organizers, uh, it is very close to our heart that we not only convey information, but also show solutions for the future and and uh, provide tools for action. Now with this shift in the industry, now there will be uh, also changes in associations such as the DVW. Now the slogan is uh, for this uh, trade fair is knowledge and action for planet Earth and it also concerns your association. So what is your strategic approach to this? Well, it's, uh, this is correct. Back in the day, we had a strong focus on science, and today we um, move. We, we are active in the strategic department. We have partners with, with whom we work. But we also work alone. Um, we have a social responsibility that we want to assume. So what are we doing? We um, draw up. Uh, strategic papers on digitization and geodesy. We have a second edition of the guideline geodesy and BIM. Um, this is an important factor for the future and for the work in the future. So we tr have the trust into the future and we want our working groups to be highly competent to find red solutions, joining hands and deliver services in on behalf of our uh, association. We will also talk about this with Kevin Weiss, but let's uh, stick to digitization. Now, this is a prerequisite of the further development of the industry. It's not a new topic. The Intergeo has talked about this quite uh, uh, many times. So, talking about BIM and also other topics, there may, there may be some room for improvement still, if I may say so. But let's have an outlook into the future. Jürgen Dold, president of um, Excellent Geosystems, um, said this yesterday. He quoted Alan C. Clark, a British uh, physicist and a science fiction author, and he said, any insufficiently advanced technology cannot be distinguished from magic. So Mr. Kutura is uh, the digital twin uh, magic. Now, the digital twin is very close to magic. Now, magic for me would be to build up upon this uh, description of our our lives. Now, this would be the basis to make for uh, this is the basis for decision making in the future in um, politics, and that's a boundary that we still haven't reached, but is um, possible. Thank you. Now, the industry is changing, and also the participants that I talked to move as well. Mr. Dalt, you are the president of Hexacon Geosystems, and you seem to be quite fond of LNC Clark because you used another quote, namely, the only way to find the limits of what is possible is to push a little beyond them into the impossible. Now, based on this, uh, I would like to you to talk about um, progress and the vision of digitization in the geospatial industry. Do you have experience? Or, um, please look back to the past 25 years of that and um, talk about the coming 25 years. Now, if we um, look at the past 25 years, then we may first say that digitization could be felt in the world of geodesy and in the world of surveyors. We were wondering how can we um, take processes in mathematics and um, display them differently, visualize them differently in maps. And uh, we had the first automated total stations, for example. And have, now, in hindsight, we have now drones and total stations which are all interconnected with GIS systems. And these were great strides that we've made uh, regarding the last 25 years. 3D city models that we drafted, I think, uh, 25 years or a few years ago, that was magic. Today, magic would be maybe how can we um, even enhance this experience? How can we um, not only make this area exclusive to geologists, but um, how can we also deliver
deliver data to smart uh, smart infrastructure? How can we quantize and scale up this development? And this is what we what I wish for for the coming 25 years for surveying. We want um, more data to be uh, and more value. We want to create more value, more data, so that we can use the aerial um, space more efficiently. Automotive mobility as well. We talked about this yesterday. It's not very smart to have rubber tires. Actually, we should have something without uh, friction. So um, the best would be to fly, but we cannot fly today. So that's the magic we talk about. So we, as a trade, we need to push it to push the boundaries and find more ways to create value that are also beneficial to uh, the environment, which are more um, resource efficient. Now talking about the future and also the present in the framework of digitization, AI plays an important role. What do you think about that? Now, artificial intelligence will help us in the future, especially to become more automated and to gain more knowledge from the data that we can create from this. We can only um, scale this if we train other machines, so um, they will never replace human resource, humans, but still we need to automate processes and draft things that um, we still need human resources for today. And these uh, are the issues, the aspects that will take us forward in the future. So we need, uh, digit in the terms of digitization, we also need software improvements in order to automate the acquisition of data in order to improve. Now, talking about interconnectivity, we also talk about interconnectivity in the industry. Startups play a vital role. They um, come up with new ideas. Hexagon is not a very small company, but still you um, search for creativity uh, among startups. Yes, that's um, correct. I wouldn't say Hexagon is a startup, but we have startups in our company. And I think that's important, especially in a, great, in a bigger company that is Hexagon, also in large organizations, depending on the remit that you have to meet. Um, there are different areas in an organization that work quite well because they have a different background and they need to improve. And we want to do the same. We want to uh, expand. And this is what uh, startups do. They, we, we receive a lot of inspiration from these, uh, from startups, from universities that have more liberal discussions on uh, future topics and they don't think about uh, their reputation, for example. There's one major issue. If you stick to the status quo and if you um, think of yourself of being um, uh, dispensable in the future, that's a problem. So what's the right mission that we have to focus on in a position? You, have to, you may wonder, is my position still relevant for the future? What do we need? Uh, it's not only about technology. Of course, there's a shift in technology, but we also need new mindsets, new forms of organization. And a startup with an age average of, mid, of the mid-20s, then I think they have the right approach. Karen Weiss. Karen Weiss. You are a senior strategy manager for civil infrastructure at Autodesk. I have not uh, translated this because I think uh, it's easy to understand. So the question that I just mentioned, um, I would ask you the same. What's the interconnectivity with startups, creativity? And is this a competence that you need in your company as well, Autodesk? Yeah, so I think that, that at Autodesk, we embrace the whole startup mentality. And in fact, we are encouraging um, our groups at Autodesk to kind of form smaller, more agile teams to, to get that creative juices flowing. But we also have our build space in Boston that we house a bunch of startups that are actually potentially feeding our technology moving forward. So yeah, the, mental the, the startup mentality is definitely something that we're embracing at Autodesk. Now, regarding your special area of BIM, we will talk about this later. Now, Vice President of Trimble, Mr. 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 Ron Bisio, what's your take on uh, the interconnectivity and the interjo? You will send uh, important signals. Um, what's, what, what about Trimble? What's your take on that? 
So regarding interconnectivity at, 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 uh, at Intergeo, I think it's, it is really important because this is a, a key time of the year for us to come together and meet our customers. And when it's funny, when I say our customers, I don't mean Trimble's, I mean our collective customers, everybody on this stage. Um, I had a chance to, I was just reflecting on a, a, a customer that I visited in South America, which was an airport project where they're doing construction of a new terminal. They're digitizing the terminal each day as they build new sections of it. It's then put into a BIM it, with your solutions and then it's shipped into the cloud and then brought over to Europe where designers work on it and then the data is brought back round tripped. So, so that's really important for us to, to look at solutions like that where we have speed, people want the data very quickly and they want to be able to collaborate amongst all of these organizations. So it gives people a chance at, here at Intergeo to walk amongst the various stands and the halls and see all of our technology together because they're going to have to make it all work. Weitere Fragen auch an Ron Visio gleich. Wir sind beim Stichwort Another question for you later. We talk about interconnectivity. It also concerns the industry and not only science, where um, we may try to bring things together. Many experts of the industry say that um, an indispensable prerequisite for the future is digitization. If we look at all the platforms that are elementary, elemental, um, ele that are elements of this future trend, intelligent transport systems, for example, building information modeling, Those are drivers for geo business, geo information, um, turn into geo information. And I want to talk about geo data. What are we doing with this? Well, this brings me to the next question for another panelist, namely Dr. Thomas Uslender from the Cultural Fraunhofer IOSB. I know everybody's interested in geodata and networking, but uh, Dr. Uslender, we would like to have a look at the way you're dealing with geodata. And you have said that data are the gold in the Internet of Things, and you're a specialist in the field of sensor technology and sensor data management. Now, how about technology? Logical development on the one hand and handling of data on the other hand and the conclusions one can derive from that, especially yeah, looking towards the smart city um, idea. Well, thanks for all the questions. No matter which domain you want to make smart, whether it's the energy sector or a smart city or uh, the production hall, we need data in order to feed them into the systems and in order to collect the data and process the data efficiently rather than having to do the same thing again, the same kind of data conversion again and again. Now, for that purpose, we need open geo and then sensor data and management architecture. There are some initial approaches already available. There are standards of the geospatial consortium and by others. And that's something that has to be spread more widely, which has to become known amongst the stakeholders going beyond the individual domain limits, because we cannot keep reinventing the wheel, otherwise the applications will not be um, profitable anymore. And Although all the things, of course, have to be smart, we also have to have a proper business case. And of course, we've got to maintain the solutions, we've got to update them. And if we cannot focus and agree on standards in this regard, and if we don't use and apply the standards, then we will end up in a situation where we don't have a digital ecosystem, but that rather these markets are dominated by big IT players only. And I think not everybody would love that idea. I think we, we need more interoperability. Now, you mentioned different types of data forms and Fraunhofer IOSB wants to create a new uniform standard or contribute to it and you have developed an open source software for that purpose for the sake of evaluating and further processing of data. Now what's the current status of that software? How far have you gone with that project? Well, the, this standard is called Sensor Things API. It's a modern interface in order to access sensor data and execute actions in the field of sensor data collection. This sensor things API standard comes from the OSI and we're also heading the working party which is driving that standard forward together with a colleague from Canada. We've got an open source implementation which is called Frost from Open source API server. Frost also means that we keep your data fresh and cool, by the way. And this open source implementation is the actually the only 
Referencing um, yeah, implementation at this point, there are other commercially available implementations and also a lot of applications in different cities all over the world, all the way to Taiwan, for example, where uh, the new application has been set up in the field of air quality. Well, talking about data, when we talk about gathering and collecting data from from the air, from the ground, whether we're talking about autonomous driving or BIM or smart city as such, well, the whole point always is that citizens are somewhat affected by it, but they can also play a shaping role. And what, what's the role the citizen plays in, in your approach? Well, from a technological point of view, it's also a sensor. Every human is a sensor, making observations and feeding the data into the overall system, but observations by a human have got a different type, they are somewhat softer. You cannot immediately derive a time series from such an observation. It's rather text-based based statements or observations coming as images or videos. So other videos come into the play as well, and especially when you talk about the smart city applications, the magic thing is to bring all of these things together and combine them with um, physically measured data. And here, once again, standards will help because uncertainties you might have must be describable via a formal language to make sure that the data from different sources can all be processed together. One example, let's say we have got a measuring network for air quality. There's one thing where you can collect data on a regular basis. But then on the other hand, you might also want to gather observations from uh, citizens who say, well, there's a strange smell in the air here. And if you're able to input this into the system in an objective manner, then this helps very much. Well, final question for you. And of course, politics is an important player as well. The development in the society and then Stuttgart is such a hotspot for air quality, for example. Uh, here we've got particle emissions causing a major problem to air quality here in Stuttgart. And, and here, of course, the quality of the data measured is also very very relevant. Yes, I mean, I think experts all know that the problem of particle emissions cannot be pinpointed to a single spot or a single location only. We, you rather need to use technologies, gathering measurements from various locations. You need to take the potential of spread of particle emissions into account. And then, of course, you need to, to first of all, validate the data in order to reach an improvement rather, just, rather than just focusing on one single spot. Of course, that requires a certain willingness to move forward, and it, it's not really an easy undertaking, but I think the, the present conclusions that have been drawn so far are not really reliable. Well, this brings to us to another president in the round. This is the president's uh, round. Dr. Shive has just been elected as the new president of the G DGFK and is also one of the organizers of the, of the Day of Cartography here in Stuttgart. And of course, data are also important for cartographs. You're not focusing on analog maps anymore only. At the same time, of course, the digital aspect plays an important role. And your slogan for this year is to keep the cards on the table. That sounds good, but what does it actually mean? Well, actually, it means that there is an ever-increasing trend for more and more open data. And the logical consequence of this is that you also have to make this data available to the various users. And here we've talked about huge volumes of heterogeneous data, very complex data and cartography as such, well, and this is our core skill, cartography is the field of expertise which rightly can claim the ability to reduce complex data to what is relevant for the various stakeholders or users. And that is where we play an important role, of course, also with the help of new technologies. And what we also, of course, have to take into account are the various users' needs. Needs. And this has also become a standard that we run fit-for-use studies in order to make sure that citizens can also use new products. Well, of course, as, as a new president, you will certainly also try to bring your own association forward. What specific goals do you have for yourself? Well, first of all, certainly networking is an important aspect which you've touched upon, and interconnectivity. Of course, cartography also has to follow an interdisciplinary approach, and that's what we want to push forward. We want to look beyond our own backyard of geodesy alone.
own approach approaching geographers and journalists and social scientists and going, going beyond just socializing and having a chat with them here or there. And maybe also sometimes launching small projects in an interdisciplinary fashion. And of course for our members, but also for non-members, we want to create attractive offers and that has to become much more differentiated than in the past. There's got to be something for the young and for the elderly, something for the scientists and more for the pragmatists. And certainly, last but not least, as we are such a small kind of community, it's also important to, to reach greater visibility in the public. There are lots of people who, who love a, a, a map, holding a map and using it to get guided by it. And that's why we have to create more enthusiasm amongst our members, but also among non-members. Now, 51% don't even know yet what, 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 what you're doing. So I think for both associations, Mr. Kutra and Mr. Chive, you still have got some room for improvement to increase your visibility, and that's what you also want to push both of you. Now, this brings us to a vice president, namely Dr. Uwe Zergel. He's the vice president of the German Society for Photogrammetry, Remote Sensing and Geoinformation. So he's the vice president, but in his proper job, he's also the director of the Photogrammetry Institute at Stuttgart University. And you are the or one of the experts for remote sensing. Now, we, we just talked about the latest trends and applications. Uh, yeah. What, what can you contribute to that discussion at this point? Well, the big advantage of satellite-based remote sensing is a repeat sensing of the Earth's surface. So we've got time series going back many years or even decades. For example, back to the year 1972, if you think of Lancet. And this data treasure allows us also to draw attention to changes on a political change, for example, climate change, urbanization, and so forth. And at the same time, this data data volume is also a curse, because even today, only a small fraction of all images can be evaluated by a human person alone. The rest of the evaluation is done fully automatically by fully automatic image analysis and pattern recognition. And therefore, I think it is very important to strengthen these areas in our university training and education as well. At the same time, of course, we, we must not blindly follow the hype of AI, because these systems are are far from being intelligent. They can only help for pre-processing purposes in order to draw our human's attention to the important things, those important things in the huge volume of data. And these specific areas then have to be evaluated by humans. As they have always done. Now, with everything you do, of course, precision plays a prominent role. And once again, when we think about the, the process from knowing things to taking action, now if everything that is measured airborne, if you've got diverse technology, laser scanning, aerial cameras, drones, I mean, what, what direction will these technologies take in terms of precision, which will then also support the accuracy of evaluation? Well, we as a society for photogrammetry and remote sensing, of course, are well prepared for that because we are used to using masses of such data. And I think the trend will be similar to what we can see with aircraft sensors, namely that you combine cameras and laser scan sensors on the same drone. But here, once again, the coordinate which means the, the target of geodesy can only be a kind of interim goal. I mean, well, what can you do with 100 million point clouds? You've got to take it further. You've got to process the data in order to reduce the density of the data in order to transfer it, transform it into actual information. Because maps, that's what people want to have. And here we still have got a long way to go. Well, with your state-of-the-art remote sensing technology, you also can exercise an influence onto certain political developments and decisions, for example, global warming and climate change. Now, 
Do you um, see any change in who asks for such data these days? Well, there are several the parallel processes. Through the Open Data Initiative, which was launched by the Americans with Landsat and which now continues in Copernicus, now through this initiative, everybody has got access to these data, even laymen, and laymen make use of that offer. So that, that leads to a kind of democratization of the use of such geodata. And that is something you can observe, especially where you but we do have some problems here or there. Just think of the forest, forest fires in Brazil recently. In, in the older days, a government might have been able to hide this kind of disaster, but that's not possible today anymore. And especially evaluation of remote sensing data also allows the international community to take earlier action, in my view. Well, this brings me to, my, to your neighbor to your right, Rolf Werner Welser. Now, he, he took took over the chair of the Expert Commission of Geoinformation Surveying and Land Use and Development of German Municipalities Association and Chairman of the Steering Committee of Geodata Infrastructure in Germany. That, that sounds like a very complex and important title, but actually you're also the General Manager of the State Agency for Geoinformation and Surveying in Hamburg. And what is even more important, you are considered one of the most important pioneers when it comes to the digitalization in a city. And once again, this is related to data. Uh, let me mention the 3D models where you were also one of the very first ones supporting that approach. Now, what you have already driven and pushed in, in Hamburg, how can you transfer this also onto the national or even international level? Well, thank you very much. Well, not, not as quickly as one wish might wish, but Hamburg really considers itself as the one who provides support and assistance. You need these kind of beacons or lighthouse projects. And Hamburg is not the only one, by the way. In order to allay fears, uh, and in order to, to create and showcase visions, because if you've got this technological power on the one hand, then you also must not forget about the humans who've got to use those technologies. So there's not only the technological dimension, but we also do have the organizational aspect which we've got to handle, and we've got the people, our staff, and that's something gets a bit neglected. And it's all going to work if necessary support is provided by politics from the very top and that has worked well in Hamburg. We've had a digital strategy since 2015 which was passed by the government and it was broken down into specific projects through a proper change management and leadership process. All public authorities in Hamburg are involved in it and that's why it also works so well. And these are the ideas which we then transfer into our steering committee for the geodata infrastructure in Germany. We also make it available to other municipalities uh, by offering advice and consultation and also by encouraging them. Science has shown great examples uh, of how people were uh, approached and we have to make them join in this development. But it's also about information competence, about education and training. Training. There's a lack of that, and at the same time, we need to communicate, we need to liaise with each other. We have developments on the Tufsud, for example, where um, they offer trainings. Um, in this regard, that's one approach, I want prerequisite. But, however, in a local community, we also need to talk with the traffic operating uh, um, traffic operators. Um, do, are they open towards you and your colleagues, or um, are there impediments in the communication that have to do with the um, operating on a daily basis? Yes and no. It depends on the example, and uh, we also always talk about added value. Of course, we have in implemented some communication platforms, um, which have been very successful in Hamburg, for example. Well, um, we want to emphasize that this issue that we face on a daily basis regarding funding, for example, what is the added value? What is the added value in terms of money? 
kann durchaus noch intensiviert of course werden, we can intensify this muss, of course we first need to invest but um, we also need to invest in know-how as you mentioned it but there are uh, calculations that uh, say and state that investments are worthwhile so investments are very important today i may mention this in the a framework of the GDI, DE, we have signed a contract. For three years, we were not very optimal. Uh, our approach was not very optimal. But now we have a special consultant for GDI, DE. Um, we are very interested to um, find the more added value and to um, su support these approaches in the future very clearly. You mentioned this earlier, please. Yes, I'd like to add something. Today, in the framework of the Intergeo, uh, we had an event, the Smart City Solution Dialogue in Hall 4. We have some representatives of cities such as Düsseldorf, Pforzheim, and here we talk and liaise with the technology uh, um, providers. We discuss the topic that is Smart Cities and also the topic open sensor data infrastructure. The city representatives uh, said they or expressed the wish that they wanted more information regarding the current state of the art, the standards that are already established and uh, whether we could communicate this. For example, a global ten a, 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 um, public tendering, um, what are the standards for that so that cities have a framework that they can adhere to that they can orient themselves. Because um, nowadays they um, do not have the staff to um, learn about all the frameworks that are there or not. You mentioned that um, that makes the Intergeo even more important as a platform um, that talks about digitization, that um, is a platform for communication for the geospatial community. There, um, it combines many different platforms and this is why this conference is so important. We have a vast amount of uh, forums where we talk about these um, topics and I think in the future these, the number of these forums will even increase. We see that um, we have to learn what the businesses are up to and what the local cities were about to, also the countries and the federal states. There's a lot to do. Now we talked about smart cities. I'd like to ask a question to Andreas Schweiger. Now if I were to um, so, well, to imagine you as a sp spokesperson at Bitkom at the iExpo for the Digital Association of Germany, I know that you not only are um, committed to agriculture but also geo-information in this regard. I think that makes sense. Now, let's talk about these two areas and connect them because you um, shed light on both of these. Um, thank you for your question. Now, geospatial information and digitization are very important. Now, with Bitkom, we um, have many different areas of application, energy, agriculture, smart cities, those uh, aspects you mentioned. And if we talk about autonomous driving and uh, autonomous drove, we need geo information. This is a vital prerequisite. Now, talking about agriculture, now geo information is also very important. If we uh, are to aim for agriculture, that is um, dealing with different uh, uh, fields and, and acres, with plants. In, on an individual level, we need information, we need geospatial information that um, render these, on, uh, these fields and tell us information, what, what plants are, or what areas are uh, more likely to grow um, crops or what which are not. So here we want to be efficient, we also want to protect the environment. Now you are, as an association of Bitkom, you are active in many different areas and yesterday we talked uh, here at Indigeo, you were part of the jury of the EIS Expo Startup Session 2019. 
ebenso beeindruckt hat wie die Jury. I find, I found it quite impressive and also the jury was quite impressed. Wir haben es vorher auch Jürgen Dold über die Kreativität. Jürgen Dold und ich mentioned also creativity earlier. Als Vernetzung eigentlich vorausgesetzt. What's interconnectivity? Uh, we need because here we, we can't have business ideas and, on an isolated basis, but um, we need information from different disciplines interconnected, and then we talk about solutions. But what was your impression here? You um, were about to award the winner of this contest. What was your impression? Well, um, I had a great impression. We had six very innovative ideas. Innovations are a vital aspect in digitization, a driving factor. We also, as you mentioned, it, we need cooperations with different partners. We need intersections, especially regarding the topic of drones. We need application areas and business cases. Um, and yesterday, I had um, a very positive I, um, impression of the participants in the contest. They had drones with a 360-degree uh, camera that can um, scan the overall um, surroundings quite realistically. They can also make the data available. Also, innovations in the construction for heavy work that can be um, can automate, automate different uh, processes in this regard. The winner was was um, an insurance company for drones, what everybody needs, basically. So, of course, this is something uh, which is important for the future. I was quite impressed by that. And I'm looking forward to future ideas. I saw um, some of the um, participants smiling, talking about insurance. That's a very smart solution, I might say, because um, insurance, such as um, Netflix, well, you um, book insurance when you fly, and it sounds all visionary, but if you you have um, asked more questions and more business cases emerged from that. And they play vital roles in the um, geo-information Karen Wise. And I will ask my last question to her. Ron, Vice Ron I have a question for you. For um, you are Vice President for Trimble. As I said, Trimble has been active, an active sponsor of, of the InterGeo. You mentioned this earlier too. This expresses your um, gratitude for this. Then um, we met, met earlier at the InterGeo and. Um, if I were to meet a representative of Trimble, then my question was, what's new in your um, industry? And you mostly say a new product. Is it simple like that, or has this changed? Or are we talking about complex solutions and processes that are behind new products? Um, we mentioned this in the keynotes and in other talks of the InterGeo. What, what's, um, what's your take on that from a Trimble perspective? Yeah, so I actually think your question ties together very nicely with some of the things you've talked about. Yes, I mean, obviously, Intergeo is a great place for us to, to introduce new products, but it, but it is funny because products, in the end, don't actually, on their own, answer the agriculture questions that you've just brought up about. It actually requires an ecosystem of, of organizations, and that's where we come to the startups. We actually have some startups working with some of our drone data and uh, processing that so that the agronomists can get that and then make better decisions about agriculture. And I think that's the kind of thing that's really important for us to get across here, is that there is an ecosystem that's required for that. And these startups are an important part of that. And this is a great place for us to meet them. And I'm excited, that's the thing I enjoy the most, is going, actually, it's fun to stand on the big stands, but I actually find the little stands where the small companies are, they're the ones that help piece all this together. And that's actually a, my favorite part of coming to Intergeo. Is this auch wichtig? Yeah, yeah, please, listen, okay. Yeah, it's important. It's also important, especially regarding personnel of Trimble, which is here present at the booth, to um, gather, gain this experience and to share experience and to um, have a look of what's happening in the industry and uh, to be part of future solutions, to be interconnected. Yeah, yeah it, it is. And it, it, it's, it's very funny because for our employees, it's a big reward to get to come to Intergeo. It's a big part of, of that. And we, so we're trying to bring as many of the recent employees who've just joined the company here to gain exposure to what is their industry. It's very easy to get very laser focused on the solutions you're building, but it's, 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 it's great for them to come and see where their products are used, how they're used amongst other companies. So. Damn. No. Now, the shift in your industry is also moving ahead ever more quickly. Decades become more um, shorter, so what does the customer expect today and also in the future from Trimble? 
Yeah, so they, they really expect speed. They want to get to the answers much, much more quickly than they did in the past. In the past, you might, you might fly in the, uh, in the fall with an aircraft, capture data, spend the winter processing that data. That doesn't work anymore. Now people want every day after the end of the construction, they want to be able to scan and get an as-built um, there and then so they can then transfer that data and start making decisions and actually modify the design. So the, the speed is there. Um, second thing is, I, and I've mentioned this before, is just they also demand collaboration. They demand that nobody, I, I don't know too many projects that I see where they have a single solution. More often, they're working with Leica products, they're working with Autodesk, they're working with Trimble, they're working with Esri, and they, and they, meet, they need us to all work together. Thanks for now. Karen. Thank you. Speed is a good, uh, now, speed is a, um, good trigger word for this um, industry that you, uh, well, that you well know, uh, namely BIM. If we talk about interconnectivity and interconnected solution, BIM is a vital um, element of um, this. So digitized um, building and planning processes are not only happening in Germany. Um, you are an international company, but um, you are very important in this aspect. If you ha have an international view on BIM, what, what is the current state of status quo? So I think what's been happening is we are following what, what um, leaders like the United Kingdom and Nordic countries have been doing in terms of implementation of BIM processes. And if we can all kind of level set that BIM is really about the creation and exchange of digital information across the project life cycle, uh, whether it's buildings or infrastructure, I think what we've learned or what the UK has been kind of teaching the rest of the world is that it, it goes well beyond design. And if we don't start using some of that information in construction, then, then ultimately in operations and maintenance where you have 80% of an asset's cost essentially um, is, is in that operations and maintenance phase. I think that now we're all on this journey. M many of us are, are maybe at the beginning stages, but I think that we're all kind of taking a cue from some of the leaders that we need to move forward and that there's benefits that can be seen if we're successful. hans Jörg Kutterer. <laughs> Mr. Kutra. Okay, take your time. Mr. Kutra. Hans Jörg Kutra. Well, Mr. Kutra initially said that we're in the midst of a process from pure spreading of information to, towards specific action. And we just talked about speed. So how much knowledge do you still have to convey in your area of responsibility in order to make sure that successful actions regarding BIM is possible at Autodesk, to make sure that we are taking more and more productive action? So I think, oh, yeah, we have to get beyond the theoretical and, and get to the actionable. And so, you know, at Autodesk, we are very committed. I think we like to think of ourselves as the father of BIM or the mother of BIM. I'm going to call it that, the mother of BIM. Um, yeah, we feel a responsibility to help the industry move forward, you know, and um, we have a large, say, group of partners and customers that are all with us on that journey to make others in the industry successful because if we're not all successful, none of us are going to be successful. Um, but one key step I think we took a couple years ago was our alliance that we formed with Esri and the whole notion that really um, geospatial information informs BIM processes. They're not separate. And in turn, BIM processes or BIM is going to feed GIS systems in the future. And that's going to help us with that life cycle of data exchange. So again, if we're really thinking about it as the ex you know, creation and exchange of structured information, um, people start to think about it, the benefits of it, a lot more broadly than if we just think about it as 3D modeling, which you know, has benefits, but a little bit limited. Übrigens, wenn Karen über Autodesk und die Mutter von BIM spricht. Well, when, if Karen calls Autodesk the mother of BIM, then she is actually one of the, the real mothers because for many years she's been involved in that, long years before she got into the industry. 
and she, she really w w worked in, in various areas, municipalities, author authorities, where BIM is a key matter. And this brings me to my last question for you, BIM. Now, what can, what can be done in politics in order to bring BIM forward? In Germany, the government in late June 2019 decided to set up a national BIM center of competence in order to optimize the digitalization of the construction industry. Now, there are lots of initiatives of this kind on a political level. Now, what's your view of these political initiatives? And because I think you also have to talk to, to politicians and national governments quite often, don't you? Yeah, so, I mean, things like that do get political because we start thinking about mandates that are being put in place, which obviously are driven by politicians. But I think from the most, um, from what I've seen internationally, it's not necessarily the politicians that are the ones that are driving this, it's really the industry, because the industry is looking for new ways of working, better ways of working, and a better result in the end. So, I mean, yes, politicians get involved when we start talking about standards and standardization, but really I think the drivers, it's coming from the industry itself. Well, thank you very much at this point. I think the industry has been well represented here today with Trimble, Autodesk and Hexagon. And on the other hand, we also had not only business representatives, but also representatives of the scientific community. Mr. Kutter, last question for, me, for you. Now, my take-home message from this panel discussion is that InterGeo is a platform of immediate exchange. A future workshop, that's a term I like very much, where knowledge and transmitting knowledge is really a reliable parameter, but on the other hand, the focus now has to be on taking action. That, that's what we have all uh, agreed upon, I think, and we now have got another one and a half days of the conference and the exhibition and the trade fair with the various platforms, and therefore I think we can be quite optimistic about this event and the future. Yes, an event like this, the Intergeo, the trade fair and also the conference, is also an, an offer for many interested parties, for, for the business community, for scientists, for politics, for municipalities. Of course, they all have to accept and use that offer to make things work. And I think that's also a bit of the, the magic behind the Intergeo. Now, m many parties involved are interested in building up know-how, know-how in the geospatial area, and this is true not only nationally, but also internationally, as this panel here shows, but also as our conference and the trade fair shows. And meeting people and presenting the current status of ideas on a face, in a face-to-face -face fashion and talking to people, I think that's really what makes the Intergeo so special. And that, that's more than just the exchange of information. I, I mean, well, what you, the term you've used, the future workshop, that's something I think describes it very well. I think we're on the right track and we'll keep moving into this direction together with our partners. Well, thanks to you and thanks to all of the panelists. I, I agree, it's been a large uh, panel and you really need a lot of patience and also stamina, which you have all demonstrated. Thanks to you. But of course, we, we can always only launch some initial questions, and if you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the media representatives do have questions now in our panel, also later on for a one-on-one -on -one interview, then I'm, I'm lo looking forward to that, and if you want to ask a question now, then please uh, indicate this to us by a brief show of hands, and then you'll be handed a microphone. Well, in, 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 in most cases, uh, people feel somewhat exhausted after such a panel, and nevertheless, however, I can reassure you that our panelists will now not run away, but they will stay here for discussing the one or the other question on an individual basis. Enjoy the rest of the conference and exhibition, and also thanks to the panelists once again.